Greetings. This is Donna Christensen, and I want to share some thoughts about Dr. and Governor Melvin Herbert Evans, um, whose birthday would have been on the 7th of this month. Um, and then I've been asked to talk a little bit about health disparities, which is something that I have, have worked on and continue to work on, uh, even though I'm retired. So um, Governor Evans grew up in Christiansted, what we used to call on the hill. Um, so he was what we call a hillsider. From early in life, he was a very studious person. And some back then would have called him a bookworm. I guess today they'd call him a nerd. But he did well, and he graduated as valedictorian from Charlotte Amali High School. A lot of times um, after seventh or eighth grade, he had to go to St. Thomas to finish. So he graduated from Charlotte Amali. And he graduated also magna cum laude from Howard University as an undergraduate. And then he continued at Howard to get his medical degree. He served in a lot of uh, medical capacities, both in the United States, particular in the States, and in the Virgin Islands. Um, he served for two years as a senior assistant surgeon general in the United States Public Health Service in, in the States. And then here he was physician in charge at the Frederickstead Hospital, chief municipal physician for St. Croix, and of course, as commissioner of health, all the while still keeping his private practice. And I can remember as a child going to his office for checkups. He was a very soft-spoken, very gentle doctor, easy to um, work to get along with. And if my memory serves me correctly, his office was in Charles Howard. He's remembered as a dedicated physician who was helpful and supportive of his colleagues. In one instance, when Dr. Evans had referred a patient to Dr. DeShabir, um, and that person needed surgery, he actually um, scrubbed in, as we say, scrubbed in with Dr. Shabert on that surgery. And his dedication to his patients is also evidenced by the fact that he did house calls. Not many doctors did at that time, and don't, many don't do it even today. After he won election to Congress, Dr. DeShabir told me a very funny story because several of his doctors and colleagues and some of his friends went with him to the airport when he was leaving to go to Washington. And he panicked and said, oh, I forgot something and ran back to his car and came back with his doctor bag. He was not going to Washington without his doctor's little black bag. And they laughed at him and asked him if they thought, if he thought he was going to take care of patients up there. You know, sometimes you do get called in an emergency, so you never know. But he insisted that he was taking his black bag with him. And just being in Congress, he made history. He was not only the first delegate from the Virgin Islands of African descent, but he was also the first Black doctor to ever have served in the history of the Congress. I'm going to read a little bit more information from the History, Art, and Archives of the U.S. House and a book by Dr. Ruth Molinar. So during his congressional career, Dr. Evans paid close attention to the needs of our unique constituency, focusing on a legislative agenda to improve education and healthcare in the Virgin Islands. He secured federal funds to provide the territory's public education system with additional programs and services for its expanding school age population. He introduced legislation to alleviate the critical shortage of doctors at all of our health facilities, permitting foreign physicians to practice in the Virgin Islands. He told his colleagues on the House floor, I firmly believe that the 120,000 people of the U.S. Virgin Islands, in addition to the 1.5 million tourists who visit annually to our islands, must be provided with the adequate medical assistance to which they are entitled. So he was already fighting for medical equity back in those days. And he served from 1979 to 1981. He also urged the House to authorize funding to build two hospitals to accommodate the growing population in our territory. Determined also to improve the quality of life beyond that for the people of the Virgin Islands, he used his position in Congress to bring awareness to a variety of local issues and concerns. He attempted to make a farm credit loan or farm credit loans available to the local fishing and agricultural sectors and succeeded in having the Virgin Islands classified as a state to make the territory eligible for full law enforcement funding. 
following the devastation wrought by Hurricane David and Tropical Storm Frederick in 1979, Evans urged Congress to approve flood control measures in the islands. In 1980, he organized congressional hearings in St. Croix and St. Thomas to investigate chronic delays in, you ready for this? Mail delivery between the United States and the territory, a problem that continues to exist today. Evans also successfully sponsored a bill that was passed and signed by the president, allowing federal recognition of National Guard officers in the Virgin Islands National Guard. As one of only 17 Black members in the 96th Congress, Evans advocated for increased rights for Blacks. Shortly after joining the House, he remarked, no one, and I'm quoting him here, no one who has not been disenfranchised understands what it means to be disenfranchised. Speaking from, of course, from the position of a Virgin Islander. And he added, from an area, you know, that got its, I, no, he says, I'm from an area, you know, that first got its delegate to Congress only six years before. Despite his Republican affiliation, he was a member of the CBC. During his tenure, he was a strong supporter of the efforts to designate Martin Luther King Day a holiday. He also strongly opposed constitutional amendment, a constitutional amendment that would have eliminated court ordered busing in public schools. He's quoting as quoted as having said, and again, this is a direct quote, when people protest how strongly they favor civil rights and how vehemently they opposed segregation, and then on the other hand, seek to remove one of the only, if not the only remedies, however imperfect, without offering a viable alternative, it causes serious concern. He clearly was a strong advocate for equality and equity. He rounded out his public career as ambassador to Trinidad and Tobago, and he died in 1981. So, a year, I'm gonna switch now into talking about, a bit about equity and health disparities. It's um, going to be a quick overview because of time. I'm always willing to discuss it further, but just to give you an idea of what, we talk, what we're talking about. A year after um, Dr. Evans died, four years after he left office, Surgeon General Heckler report, issued a report that showed, based on research, that over 60,000 African-Americans were dying in excess numbers in 1985. And that meant that they were dying prematurely from preventable causes. It should have sparked more alarm than it did. A lot of this research has said, well, it's always been that way. And you'll find that somehow that attitude has not totally gone away. I looked at the diseases um, that were pretty much the cause of those health disparities and those premature deaths. And actually, our leading causes of death were pretty much the same. Heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes complications, kidney disease, not as much respiratory disease back then as in the, state, in the, in the rest of the states, or suicides. But both of those, as we know, have increased somewhat in recent years. So when I went to Congress, it was 16 years after Dr. Evans left, I was the first female physician ever to serve in the Congress. Um, and I took up the cause of equity, I took the um, baton from him and took up the cause of equity, mainly focusing on health as I promised my patients when I left, I would focus on healthcare. But what we learned as we looked into the diseases still, our leading causes of death here were and remain heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, and kidney disease, rounding out maybe number four. But what has increased that used to be around nine back when I went to Congress, homicide is now around number five. As a matter of fact, in 2016, it was listed as number three. So... Um, as we looked at these diseases, we realized that a lot of the causes, the root causes were similar across, whether it was diet, exercise, those kinds of things. We focused a lot early in the early days on personal responsibility. But as we looked further, we found that underlying all of the, the health disparities, 
and I'm going to talk, let, let me show you some of them, are, are what we call social determinants of health. The, the environment in which people really are struggling to be healthy, but the system is just not there to support it. And in, in the United States, and to some extent here as well, um, the, the systems that create these social determinants are really based on racist policies that have created systems and institutions that perpetuate them. So let me try to share what I usually share when I speak about health disparities, and it's not there now. Oh, yes, it is. But I have to move it up. I have to go up to the beginning. Let me go to the beginning. Okay, so at the very basis of health disparities and health inequities is poverty. In the Virgin Islands, the latest census said um, our poverty rate is somewhere around 20%, 22%, I think it said, I think it's higher than that. But the Kids Count report said that our children about 30% of our children are living in households that are below poverty. So I, I do think that it's a bit higher. The next, the next slide also talks about um, unemployment and you can see that in the states, these are stateside figures, um, black Americans have higher um, unemployment, which also contributes. Our household incomes are different. And I have some notes here that I took about household incomes, where are they? But our household, our average household income in the Virgin Islands, for example, is 37,254. That's the last report I got. The median household income in the United States. Now median may be a little different than average, but the median household income, which is what they report, is 70,784 compared to 37,254. And the lowest range in that mean is 47,189, still above the average household income in the Virgin Islands. So we have a disparity there as well. And you can see the median household income for Blacks in the States is, is lowest. So these are the things that drive poor health. Um, and let me go on to the next slide. It has been shown, and there are suits pending, that there are suits pending that um, show that where the Hispanic and Black students are the majority of, in the school districts, they get less money, Two, 23 billion less. And there are suits in different places, different parts of the states that are um, trying to equalize that. Many parts of the country, are, there are food deserts and there are transportation issues as well. So if there's not a grocery, a good grocery store near you, if you don't have good bus transportation, that's another um, social determinant of health. And we have areas here that don't have good public bus transportation, and it makes it difficult for them to get to a good to a grocery store, even to go to get health care. Let me move this up a little. Um, one of the other social determinants that we often don't think about is the lack of uh, Black and Hispanic physicians. It's an issue that um, one of my, um, show this one instead, where you see that the Black physicians are 63.6.3, Hispanic 5.5, and um, the white and Asians are in the 80%, 80 okay? So that's an issue that the National Medical Association to which I belong is really trying to tackle. But a lot of it happens because of the poor educational systems that provide the K through 12 education. If we can fix that, and that's a, that's a particular um, pet peeve of mine, that we don't focus enough on improving K through 12 throughout. You see, I already showed you a slide that shows that the investment in those schools 
are less in the States. They're probably not less here, but in the States, a lot of property taxes and so forth go to support the schools. So if you live in a poor neighborhood, your property taxes are not going to support the schools as well as somebody that lives in a more um, up, upper income uh, community. But it's the responsibility of government to be able to equalize that so that everyone has access to an equal, uh, uh, a good education. Because there are not enough doctors of color, there, there is racial bias right in the doctor's office. There was another uh, report that was done in uh, 2002 called Unequal Healthcare where it showed that there is bias against people who are Black, people who are um, speak a different language, um, who are foreign, uh, and assumptions that are made. You're not going to take. You're not going to take your medicine, or um, even if I do this procedure, you're not going to follow my instructions. So you don't get the same uh, investigations for heart disease and so forth that somebody who is white would get. And it a lot of what I'm talking about also applies to the American Indian, okay? Um, for example, one of the things that you probably hear a lot about is the, um, maternal mortality. Now, the United States has a high maternal mo mortality, higher than any other industrialized nation. But even at, with that, Black women are three to four times more likely to die in for a, from a cause related to pregnancy, even before, during, or after pregnancy. You, uh, you probably have heard about, it. was it Venus or Serena? One of those sisters um, had a really traumatic, she could have died. I have friends who are well up in income who have met with different problems. I, at one of my national medical associations, a husband spoke about his wife who died in childbirth. But it's not just what what is important to understand. It's not just what happens in the delivery room. For for throughout a person's lifetime, if you're not getting good health care, you get to your pregnancy in, in less health. But guess what? In the Virgin Islands, we don't have that problem. And we have a lot of people that end up going to delivery without getting adequate prenatal care or who are high risk for one reason or another. And our maternal mortality is pretty much zero. So I'm very proud of that. Another issue that we've done very well at is infant mortality. I remember when I was, before I went to Congress anyway, and while I was still practicing and working in public health, the infant mortality rate was about 13 per thousand persons. It is now 5.8 and going, continuing to reduce. And it's actually lower than the national infant mortality rate. So when we apply, we, co we complain a lot about our healthcare, but when we apply what we know, we can prevent some of the things that are still happening in the States because um, African-Americans and, and Native Americans are about twice as likely to have infants that die before they're one year old. And if the bias, the individual bias is not enough, what we found is that there are the AI, artificial intelligence is used to determine what your life worth is, and that will de determine how much is spent on your health care if you enter into a hospital, whether the insurance company is going to pay, how much they're going to pay. That is pure systemic institutional racism. But some of the universities have done some research on it and um, we're doing much better. So our leading causes of death here are, are as I said, heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, and, and homicide. Um, our life expectancy though is for women, it's 83.5 years. And for men, it's 76.8. It's still, both in both cases, higher than the, the, the rest of the, the states, the rest of the United States, which is 7.9 for, for women. Ours is 8.83.5 and 73.2 
nationally for men, and we're 76.8. But it still has decreased um, across the board, really. But in the States for African Americans and Hispanics, it decreased more than for, for whites. COVID has a role to play in that. But also our homicides have a role to play in, in our reduced um, life expectancy. Some of the issues that um, where we're seeing inequities in the Virgin Islands. Medicaid is one. Now, what I found was that our, our Medicaid threshold for eligibility has gone up tremendously. It used to be about $6,000 per year per person, about 10,000, 12,000, maybe 10,000 for a family of four. Right now, it's $17,888 for a family of four to qualify for Medicaid. But in the States, it's 33465 That's a big disparity. That's a big disparity. It's something that Ron DeLugo fought for, I fought for, state-like treatment in Medicaid, and Stacy continues to fight for it. She was almost, she was very close to that and to SSI, which is denied to people in the territories, except for one who had given up what we call temporary assistance to needy families to get SSI. So they, they have traded it off, but um, we need both. Um, and sometimes there are immigrants who are there legally who can get SSI in the States and, and American citizens in the territories can't. But the climate in Washington right now is not supportive. It's not supportive. Um, I wish we could have done it last year. So, I want to just close by, you know, we, we used to talk about equality. But let me show you the difference between equality and equity and where what we need to be fighting for. And you, you, for students, you're not too young to start looking at these things around you and, and getting involved. So let me share this. Um, here, let me share, let me share this one. So, and this speaks a bit to reparations and in addition to equity and justice, but as you can see, not everybody has the same opportunity to see over the fence, whether they're looking at a ball game or whatever they're looking at. Not everybody has that that equality. And, and, and that's what we have been facing that causes African-Americans, Native Americans, and other people of color, some people living in rural areas to have worse health than others. So you can work for equality and give everybody the same thing. But you can see that that little girl still cannot see over the fence, even though you treated everybody equally. What we have to begin to do is to put more resources and more investment where it is most needed. And when you do that and you give that little girl something extra because she needed it to be able to see over the fence, you get equity. But what we all, what we need to really do is remove all barriers, all barriers to access to healthcare, mm -hmm. which is quite an awesome task because it means that we have to look at all of those social determinants and remove those that are impairing our ability to be healthy. And that's when we'll get to justice. So um, this is just a quick overview of health equity. Um, it's something that needs to be an ongoing, strong effort. And the headwinds are against us right now because it looks like Black people are being targeted for everything. We, we can't even talk about our history in some places in the States now. So it's something that I want you to be aware of and be ready to defend and, and help us to work towards equity. Um, support those in the election who talk about equity, who have shown that they have a commitment to equ equity. Um, and make sure that you do your part. So thank you. I'm willing to continue this conversation because I know this has just been a quick overview, but um, I hope it has whetted your appetite to really look around and see what you think 
needs to be fixed in our territory to make people more healthy and to be well and to have a high quality of life. So thank you.